How's everyone this morning? <laughs> Why would you be here to be humiliated? Can I ask you? Yeah, but why would you come thinking you're going to be humiliated? Oh, there's always that yeah. Why is that? Can you see? Can you see that like already you set up a dynamic where you're already resistive to truth? Because if 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 any time you come to a place thinking you're going to get humiliated, you're not going to be open to receiving truth. Can you see that? The the feeling of I'm going to be humiliated is a resistance to actually hearing the truth. So there's a little, little point coming to a place when you feel you're going to get humiliated. Like, why do we feel humiliation? Like, why do we feel we're going to be humiliated just by receiving the truth anyway? If you think about it. The, the reality is that the truth is a beautiful thing. And, and if you have a feeling that you're going to get humiliated from it, then that it's important to deal with that emotion because it's just this emotion that's blocking the reception of truth. Does that make sense? Yeah. What, what else? What was there in Well, I've got the same. I've got the same injury, big time. Yeah. And I, I'd like some tips on how to how to actually deal with it because I've tried different ways and I feel stuck with it. Well, the the feeling of being humiliated is actually a rageful feeling. So we, we can talk about that in, in over over time. A lot of people feel it's not involved. It's not a rageful feeling, but it, it really is. Like, and uh, we'll talk about how that is, certainly, if that's an issue. Um, we can certainly talk about that. Yep. How does everyone else feel? Because uh, when you think about it, why would somebody want to present the truth to you when you're already in fear <laughs> of the truth? What, it's almost like we might as well pack up right now and go home. Does that make sense? Yes. If that's how it is for most of you, you're feeling, oh, oh what, am I, what is he going to say to us? You know, like, and how, how are we going to, like, what's going to be the presentation today? And you feel worried about it. Then the reality is that we might as well pack up before we even begin. Because there's already a resistance to receiving some truth. And instead of seeing the truth as a wonderful thing that's going to free you, you're still seeing the truth as a thing that you want to resist. That you want to stay away from. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you if you see the truth like that, then you're always going to be frightened of it. And when you're frightened of truth, can anybody really tell you any truth? Not really. You're going to get angry, or you're going to get upset. You know, you're going to go into some kind of tantrum about it, or or something like that. You're not going to be open to receiving the truth, but it's only receiving the truth that's going to get you closer to God. So in a in a way, you're setting up. Inside of yourself, you're setting up this resistance <coughs> that prevents you from ever growing. Can you see? No. So it, it, it seems to be like if we, if we come to a session with already a lot of trepidation and fear, then, then the reality is we, we need to consider why we're even going to the session because we're not open to truth in that place. The other reality is that while you're in that place, your spirit guides who are trying to guide you to more truth can't give you more truth either. That's the reality. So, so they're wanting to give you more truth and there's people on earth wanting to give you more truth but while you're in a place of feeling afraid that you're going to get humiliated, that you're going to somehow get exposed and it's all going to be embarrassing and, and all of those kind of emotions, they're all emotions that just stop. They're like a wall, a barrier up inside of yourself. So a way to prevent <coughs> the truth from actually entering you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if, if, we, if we come to a session with that kind of uh, attitude, then the reality is we're already blocked before we begin. Okay? And that's something that we need to address. Like, why are we so blocked before we even begin? And I feel this is a uh, you know, one of the problems that the team is experiencing, we'll talk more about the team in a minute, but one of the problems the team is experiencing is this resistance to truth. You, you want to stay as a team, this arts team, wants to stay in its addictions. That's all you really want to do. You want to live in your addictions with the team. And the God's Way of Love teams have not been set up to help you live in your addictions. 
that have been set up to help you become more loving. And to become more loving, we're going to have to get out of our addictions and into truth. And if we're resistive to truth and wanting to stay in our addictions, then, then the actual team is not going to be very helpful. And if everyone in the team is like that, then the team itself will just founder. It, it can't actually survive like, like it currently is working. So to be frank with you, with regard to the arts team, I have considered disbanding it altogether because of its addiction. But instead of doing that, what I would like to do is work with you about your addictions and your resistance to truth and help you get into a place that's a bit more open to, to receiving truth and, and a bit more um, in feeling a bit more joy about the receiving of truth, like that it's not a hardship to receive truth. It's actually a pleasure, that kind of feeling. Because for the majority of us, we're still viewing it as a hardship to receive truth. Like, and we don't, we don't view it as a pleasure. And if we can view it as a pleasure, then we won't be resistive to it. And if we're not resistive to it, we have a chance to grow. But if we're viewing it as a pressure, a humiliation, a fear-based uh, feelings about the truth, then what's going to happen is we're not going to grow at all. We don't have a chance to even grow. Yeah. You um, wanted to ask a question? I've met a lot of artists who claim that their art is a way to get away from the pain. Exactly. So is there a dynamic happening there? Is it on a cultural level? Yes. Yeah, I feel for... A, and remember right at the beginning when we set up... I don't know if any of you re-listened to the presentation I gave to the arts team when we set up the arts team. But I said the arts team is going to have the biggest desire to stay in its addictions of all teams. Right? And in fact, most people who become artists, to a degree, become artists because they want to stay in certain addictions. They want to avoid their pain. And in fact, their art becomes an expression of their pain. And in fact, they like that. Many of them are famous because of it. Right? Many of them have had fame as a result of the, the avoidance of their emotions, because while they're in this place where they feel you know, all their grief and they're outwardly expressing all of their grief, not, live, not, not, not actually releasing it, but living in it, then they get all the spirits around them who inspire them in that same direction and they become very passionate along those lines. They are very inspired you know, with spirits giving them the lyrics to songs or, the, or the, you know, the paintings that they can paint that actually express their feelings. And the reality is while, that's, while that is not necessarily a bad thing, it depends on how you act upon that, the reality is for the majority what they're doing is they're staying in their addictions and staying in their um, locked down emotions. And as a result, they become famous because of even doing that. And now they have an even greater desire to stay in their addictions and stay in their, their, their unhealed emotions because without that, they wouldn't have become famous in the first place. And the reality is for, for most people on the planet, they're using their art, connecting to people but they're connecting to other people's pain right? and both finish up not healing. Stuck. Right? Both finish up stuck. And so you have a whole audience of 10,000 people going along to some musician and they're all there bopping to the music or all connecting to the music, but all of them are staying in their addictions. And the reality is that's not what we want this team to do. We don't want this team to stay in its addictions, we want this team to grow and to give you an opportunity to grow. And to engage some of these desires and passions that you actually have, but to do it in a way that's loving to yourself, loving to your neighbour, uh, and loving to the environment around you. That's really what we want to do. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, at the moment what's happening is the team is very much in its addictions. And what I would like to do is discuss with you some of those addictions. Right? And also there is an expectation in the team that the team should be doing what... Um, well, that Ivana, as the leader of the team, should be doing what the people in the team dictate to her to do. And there is a strong desire for that to occur. 
And if Ivana doesn't go along with it, then Ivana doesn't know what she's doing. There's also that projected at her. And because Ivana is younger than the majority of you, there's also a projection at her of condescension. And there is also a lack of respect for her and, and, her, you know, her, and what she does for the team. And we'll talk about some of these things. And Ivana's going to be quite embarrassed about me talking about some of these things, but that's what I'll do. Sorry about that. Um, because we, we need to address these issues. Yeah. I'm okay with you as an artist staying in your own addictions in your own home and staying in your own addictions in your own life. But when you involve yourself with the God's Way of Love team, you are now involving yourself with something that I do want to bring into harmony with love. So straight away, you and I are going to be in conflict with each other because I'm going to want to present the truth to you about your addictions. And if you want to stay in your addictions, you're going to feel that conflict. Now, this team has a great opportunity to deal with many of its addictions, but it also, <laughs> unfortunately, has a great opportunity to stay in them. And many of you are staying in them, to be frank. You're staying in these addictions, the ones of you who have been involved with the team are staying in your addictions. And you don't want to heal these particular emotions that you have. And to be frank with you, I would feel a much more comfortable if this team had five members who really wanted to passionately grow and, and change and bring their art into harmony with love and, and those kind of things, then I would, for the team to have 50 members or 100 members who are all in their addictions. That's what I would prefer to say. <coughs> so what we want to do today is address some of these issues emotionally, <coughs> if we can. Can we do that? Yes. Yeah? How open are you to doing it? <laughs> Deal with this feeling that you're going to be humiliated and deal with the feelings that, you know, that you feel afraid or whatever of hearing the truth. And there'll be some times, some statements I make that you feel are quite unfair and you need to deal with that too. Because at the end of the day, we want to bring every team in the God's Way of Love organisation into harmony with it, the underlying goals and charter of the organisation. Now, I've encouraged many of you to read it. If you haven't read it, read it. Because you, what's the point of getting involved in a team that has a charter that you've not read? <laughs> to me, there doesn't seem much point to that either. You need to understand what the underlying goal is of the organisation and what we want to achieve in the organisation before you'll understand what the goal of this team is going to be. Now, there's so many really beautiful things that the team can do, but unfortunately, they're not going to grow. It's not going to happen while everyone's in an addiction and while you're wanting to stay in your addictions. Does that make sense? Can I ask another question? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, though, if what we brought up about there's so much pain behind art, and it's a very common thing. Yep. That uh, two things. One, are people feeling like if they don't express their pain, there's nothing there to express? Yes, a lot of people who feel that. You know, <laughs> certainly. And then, two, my second question is, if you're going to create art that's expressing your pain, are you better off just processing your emotion instead? Well, it's fine to create art that expresses your pain and process, and and also then process your emotion as a result of that expression. <laughs> But I, I feel where it becomes addictive is when you want everyone in the group then to say, isn't this wonderful that they did this particular piece of art? And to me, no, I don't feel that is necessarily wonderful because that is addictive art yeah. where you're going, to stay in your, you're going to stay in your unhealed emotions if you, if you start embroiling other people in that process. Now, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, for example, listen to a song or, or look at some art that's been produced, or look at even some pottery or uh, other things that might have been produced that express a person's pain, but not when that person now expects me to share their pain. Yeah. Now that's out of harmony with love immediately. But are you only going to find it? Well, I mean, this, are you going to have a tendency to find it beautiful if you share the same pain? Of course, right. of course. And this is the thing: is that many of us are stuck on what we see as beautiful. Yeah based on the world's painful location and, and position. 
And, and when we get into our second sphere condition and in our third sphere condition, the reality is we're not going to find the same things good. Yeah. That's the reality. The reality is you're not going to find the same things uh, beautiful that you found when you began. But if you follow your passion for that particular piece of music or art or whatever it is that we're following along the arts team, then, and you follow your passion and you're willing to tweak it to bring it into harmony with love, now you have the, you have the ability to grow permanently. Mm. If you go into your passion, into your addiction, and say, oh, like, and, many, and I'll explain how many of you are doing this at the moment, and what happens is you go into your passion with your addictions in play, you want everyone around you then to meet your addictions and to give you approval and to give you the acceptance in your current state. The problem with that is they're going to be approving of your current unhealed state. Now, that is going to just help you stay in your current unhealed state, is it not? So that's not going to be very effective at all. So we need our, we, uh, the reality is that if we are really truly healing with regard to using our art to heal ourselves and also to help others heal, then we won't be in one place or in a stagnant condition for very long at all. We'd be moving and changing and our art will actually express whether that is music or art or some kind of other uh, production that we do. And mm -hmm. all of that will express the changes that we're making. Yeah. in the soul. Mm. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so, it'll, it'll, so what you feel is great now, in three months' time, you look at it and you go, gee, I was pretty sad that day when I, when I drew that picture. Or I was pretty sad when I wrote that song. You know, like, and, uh, and then in six months' time, you, you listen to the, to the song you did three months ago and you go, gee whiz, boy, I was really angry then, you know, and I thought that was really good then, but now I think, oh, a bit embarrassed, you know. And, and the reality is that everything that you produce during those phases will help other people connect to those emotions. But if you do it in a way that you want an addiction met, they are going to stay in those emotions. They are not going to heal either. So if you want glory, attention, approval and acceptance, which is, to be frank, many of you want these things, you want those things from your art. And if you want those things, you are going to create a dynamic with your listeners that only those listeners that engage those addictions will actually want to listen to your, or, or look at your art. And then the dilemma is you'll lose your fan club if you change. Okay, yes, that is very true. And if you lose your fan club, then you'll feel no good anymore, which is the whole reason why you began this vicious cycle in the first place, was to feel good. Right? Well, they might come with you. Uh, well, the reality is they will, or you will get a whole new base of people <laughs> being drawn along. That's the reality. But, but we don't often think about that because we're so much in our addictions that we only are focused on whether people approve of them or not. And as soon as nobody approves of them, we no longer want to do them. And this is another fact that many of you are not engaging your art unless you get approval from others with it. And that's not the function of this team to give you approval for your art. The function of this team is help you to help you connect with a desire and then to grow that desire into more harmony with love. That's the function of the team. Right? It's not the function of the team to help you connect with your current passions and desires which are highly addictive and then to satisfy those addictions so that you feel good. That's not the function of the team. Can you see the difference? And many of you are thinking that the first thing, this, this addictive thing that you're expecting from the team is the thing that you want from it. And when you don't get it, you then become <coughs> upset. Right? Now, before I went, well, when I was over in Greece, I wrote uh, Ivana an email suggesting, for example, that um, we do a series of um, auditions to do a production as a team. And many of you, I could feel, were very upset about that. Very upset about that. And yet, if you were thinking in harmony with love, you would say to yourself, hmm, the reality is that if I'm loving, I would want my presentation to be the best it could possibly be. That's the reality. The reason why I'd want it to be the best it could possibly be is because I don't want to have listeners, in the case of my music, cringing for the entire five minutes that I'm playing a song or singing. I 
want them to be able to engage emotionally, enjoy the production at least, don't I? Rather than just spend the whole day, gee, this is a terrible song, and gee, <laughs> it's sung terribly as well, and gee, it's got so many mistakes in it, uh, I can hardly even sit in my seat, I'd rather go home. Now, the loving thing to do would be to ensure that we do the best we can possibly do. Not in comparison with other people, but just in comparison with our own self, that we actually do the best we can do. Now, the reality is that if I'm in a place where I desire to do the best I can do, then I will practice probably every day. That's the reality, isn't it? You look at most musicians who are performers, who are performers, they practice pretty much every day. They're in their passion every day. If something is a passion, you are in it every day, whether anyone around you agrees with it or not. That's the reality. You are going to do it every day, whether anybody around you is listening or not. Now, for many of us, we want people to be able to hear us or listen to us. And for many of us, we're not in our passion unless somebody can hear us or listen to us. We don't feel motivated to practice unless we've got somebody who's going to listen to us at the end of the day, like in a production. And those kind of things are not what the team wants to be involved in. Like I said, I'd be much happier with five people in the team who are in their passions and desires and, and growing in love because the reality is that team would then attract a lot of very positive events. Right? The reality is at the moment the team isn't going to attract any positive events because we're in our addictions, mostly. Now, can I address some of those addictions? Those of you who are older than Ivana, how old are you, Ivana? 20. 20? <coughs> Three. Three. Okay. Maybe you need to say those who are younger. So that's pretty much <laughs> all of you, is that not? Except for a couple. You all have an addiction. <coughs> Many of you have an addiction. You have this belief that because you're older, you know better. And you shake your head, but the reality is you do feel this. That because you're older, you know better. And that's one reason why Ivana gets a projection of anger and rage at, at her for not doing what you want. Now, the reality is that I selected Ivana to run the team because I felt she was in the least amount of addiction of all the people who had a passion for art that I could see. That's the reality. The fact is that when you condescend towards her, you're actually condescending towards me as well. <clears throat> and to be frank with you, if I had sat in a, t in a team meeting where I felt any condescension towards Ivana, I would have automatically removed the person who was condescending without any statement or question other than please leave your condescending. Now, it's not the role of these teams to correct your emotions. Do you understand that? The teams are not created so that they, somebody says, oh, you're being condescending. Do you want to know why? <laughs> We're not interested in why you're being condescending at all. We're only interested in that you either are being condescending or not. That's all. <laughs> and if you wished to be condescending, then you need to go somewhere else to do that. Because what we want here is a loving environment that allows everybody to express themselves without condescension being present. You see, the whole thing of what we're trying to do with the God's Way of Love organisation is to set up an organisation where you can come here and be guaranteed to be treated lovingly. And that applies to the team leaders as much as to any other person in the team that you can be guaranteed that you're going to be treated lovingly. Because everybody who comes along wants to love more. Does that make sense? So, so the first thing the team needs to have a focus on, on is becoming more loving. It is not loving to be condescending to your team leader for any reason. It's not loving. And Ivana has the right to be here in a space of love as much as you do. That's the reality.
So every time you become condescending with her, you're actually demonstrating that you're not loving. Now, now many of you are expecting, oh, well, then somebody should have said something to me about me not being loving. Somebody should have said, you know, somebody should have said that, you know, I'm not loving and this is the reason why. When I'm said, I've said to all the team leaders, Ivana included, the team leader's role is not to tell you what your unhealed, unloving emotions are. They don't have to help you with any of those emotions because that is your responsibility. Do you understand? It's not their responsibility to do that. It, their, their responsibility is only to lead the team and its passions and to make sure the environment is loving for any person who comes along. That's their responsibility. And if the environment is not loving, they find the person who's not being loving and they ask them to leave. That's what I've asked them to do. Now, Ivana has found that difficult to do because what happens for Ivana is she's felt the projections and then she closes down. Right? So I've talked to Ivana about how she closes down and stops, stops engaging the projection. And, then, and because she's afraid, in particular, of rageful women, because she's a bit afraid of her mother in that space, and she then is afraid to address some of the issues that become unloving in the team. <clears throat> Now, what I've encouraged the team leaders to is just to ask the people who are being unloving to leave immediately. And it's not the team leader's responsibility to tell you why and what the emotion is. Or how to deal with it. Or how to deal with it, even. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's not the team leader's responsibility to do that, because that is your responsibility. Your responsibility is to find out how you're being unloving, why you're being unloving, why you feel you can project that particular thing at the team leader, and what's going on inside of yourself, to work it out for yourself in your own relationship with God. Be self-responsible. But love needs to be the focus inside of yourself to do that, doesn't it? Like, if you come along with an addiction in play, then love's not in play straight away. What's in play instead is the addiction, and all, that, all addictions are unloving, all of them. So if I've got an addiction that, you know, I'm hurt, the reality is I'm being unloving the moment I walk in the door, if I have that addiction. And, and let's say nobody hears me and then I get upset about it and I start getting angry and Ivana then says, well, you're angry now and I'm going to ask you to leave. And you'll go, this is not fair, I wasn't hurt, that's the reason why I was There's no reason why you're angry, to be frank, aside from the fact that you don't want to love. That's all. And you need to be asked to leave. Now, I'm perfectly happy for you to go and be unloving in your own environment. I'm perfectly okay with you doing that. You have free will in your own environment. However, here, this is an environment that we're trying to put into practice God's principles and laws, not yours. Does that make sense? So what we're trying to do in this environment is to bring it in harmony with more love and truth in this environment. We're not going to do that if we just accept people coming along all the time who continuously treat other people badly or unlovingly and we don't do anything about that. That's not the answer to bring this environment into more harmony with love. That's just anarchy. And that's not what's going to happen here. Anarchy is not what's going to happen. So what would be like in the case of like where you're condescending? Yep. I mean, I'm assuming in that moment you feel like you know better than somebody much younger than you. Yes. And then, is the um, how does that tie into the dynamics of like disagreeing with somebody? Because disagreeing with somebody is is not necessarily unloving, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's okay um, to disagree with somebody. So, it's, mind you, can I point out yeah. to you if if you're in a certain condition of love, disagreements become far less frequent. Yeah. Do you, do you understand? It doesn't like, you will be firm for the truth, yeah. and if somebody's just firm for the truth, you'll be happy. Uh -huh. right? And if somebody's not firm for the truth, then you'll say, oh, you're not being firm for the truth, this is the issue of truth. Yeah. But you won't feel like arguing or fighting with them. Right, right. Yeah. right? So you can disagree and still love them. Right. Yeah. So it's, I'm not saying that these team leaders are perfect, yeah. and I'm not saying that at times you might disagree with them. But I am saying that whenever you have a, dis a feeling of condescension or anger towards them or belittling them, they are unloving emotions. Now we're out of harmony with the thing we've come here to practice and learn about, the love. 
So it's okay to disagree. There's not a problem with disagreements. The issue is how are we going about it? Are we being loving? Do we get all resentful? Do we go, oh, I'm not going to do that now. I'm not going to go along with that now because of those things <laughs> happening. The reality is the addictions are going to be more in play in the organisation than anywhere else. And the main reason why is when you go along to some kind of per employment, for example, then there are a certain set of rules that you have to abide by, whether you like them or not. And so you don't even bother you know, questioning them. You just go, oh, that's the rule of this company and I've got to abide by that. So you don't even go... You, you go along with the rule because of the, the job entails you going along with that rule. The problem with the, the organisation is the rule is love. <laughs> and most of us are still not very comfortable with love. In, for, in fact, we're more comfortable with our addictive, unhealed, unloving emotions than we are with love. That's the reality. We're more comfortable with, with untruth than we are with truth. That's also a reality at the moment. And so when love becomes the rule, we all get confused. It's also the reward rather than money, isn't it? That's right. Well, it, it, well, it is. But, but the problem is we're so confused yeah. a lot of the times because, because all of our addictions are still in play. There's all these things we want to still get, we still want to feel from our environment. And... And there are less controls than a normal place of employment or a normal group or a normal association that has a whole set of charters or rules already in writing that you've got to abide by. And if you don't abide by them, you just get removed. Right? And because of that, we've got to now feel about the love inside, you know, both inside of us and the love in terms of our interactions with others. And many of us feel very confused about that. Because we believe our addictions are loving. And so we, start, we get confused when somebody says, well, I'm sorry, that's not loving. We go all confused and we think, well, what do you mean that's not loving? I've always believed that's loving. Right? And then what we do is we impose these addictions upon the environment by going into some form of resistance. Usually that is anger-based resistance. And that's what I'm saying the group is doing very regularly right? as a group. Now, if love isn't the rule, then there's no point in having the team. We might as well just disband the team and wait until everyone who would like to be a part of the arts team becomes into a more loving condition where, for them, love becomes the rule. Does that make sense? Now, I don't want to do that, but I'm perfectly happy to do it if that's what we need to do. What I would prefer to see is that everyone becomes in the team becomes a little more self-analytical and allows themselves to ask themselves, when are they being unloving? And to not focus on everyone else but themselves with regard to their unloving feelings. So when you heard, for example, that I wanted to do some auditions, what were your feelings, honestly? What were your feelings? I felt, um, I was in an audition anyway because I didn't have any talent. Okay, so you felt hurt because you felt you had no talent? and well, therefore know, probably hurt, yeah. yeah. Because, like, Would you have normally got up and present, prepared something if you didn't have to audition? Um, no. Okay, so... Yep. Come on, guys. A lot of you guys were very outspoken about this issue, I know. So what's, what were you feeling? Be honest. Um, I'll expose myself. I, I, I felt um, that I didn't... I felt superiority and that I did... Because I actually feel the opposite, but that I'd done... I'd run many auditions myself in the past and, mm -hmm. and what did Abana know? Yep. And I was not going to be humiliated. And, I mean, that's horrible to say, but I, I'm, I'm... That's OK to say these things. Like, it is OK to say these things, to, to be frank about what yeah. is really there. There's no point in having the team if we can't all be frank about what the emotions are present and what we need to heal. So I don't see any shame in being honest about what's really there. None at all. Do, do you understand? It, many of you still have severe amounts of judgment about your unhealed emotions. You need to give up this judgment. You need to just be honest about what the unhealed emotion is. Right? 
So, so the reality for yourself, yes, is, is that. That certainly is there, isn't it? So that's okay. Acknowledge it's there. Yeah? So anybody else? Matt? Um, I guess my feeling is why not allow everyone an opportunity to perform and just allow the audience to kind of get up and leave and come and go as they want to, as people are doing it. Well, you know, that might sound like a good idea initially. It might sound all free willish and stuff. <laughs> but why, what, what's, the, what's the error in love in that? Can you see the errors in love in that? It won't be organised. It won't be organised for a start. And things that are, God always does organise things. But what else? The audience has got to suffer. The audience has got to suffer, yes. They will suffer. There will be certain things that go, oh, this is so bad, I just can't sit here, right? And, uh, and, and the, of course that's going to be quite triggering for the performer, which is understandable, but the reality is the performer shouldn't have an attitude in him or her that the audience should have to suffer. Should he? If he loved the audience, would he want to make the audience suffer? No. He wants the audience to be able to enjoy it, surely. And if the audience can't enjoy it, then I wouldn't even get up. Like if it was me, and, and I just feel like, yeah, I'm pretty off today. You know, I'm full of grief, my throat's all congested. Singing today is just woeful. I'm not going to sing today because it's just going to be a mess, right? And I don't want the audience to put up with that mess. They don't, you know, if I love them, I care about them, I won't want them to put up with it. Yeah? What else? when you say that, it's like the auditions they have on TV, um, would you get up in front of 10,000 people and not have passion, not be practiced and not have mastered your yeah. skill and would you sing in front of them and what would you expect from that crowd and why should we be any different? Yeah, exactly. Can you uh, put up your hand though the next time you ask a question? Thanks, Carol. I actually felt gratitude because it felt to me that uh, and I also realized that there is a good chance if I did audition that the things that I'm interested in might not be fixed. Mm -hmm. but it's uh, can I just yeah, say some things to you? Yeah. You are not being honest. Okay. All right. Now, these are the things you want to believe about yourself, mm -hmm. not the things that are really going on inside of you. You have some very big addictions happening with singing in particular and performing, and you need to examine them there's a huge projection coming out of you that an audience must listen to you. So, so, so allow yourself to connect to that, that, those feelings that are really present, rather than telling yourself that there's a different set of feelings that are present. The reality is in your private session, if I could raise the private session that happened at, at uh, Kath Catherine's place, you weren't considering the audience at all. You did not consider the effect the unloving effect of what you did on your audience at all. So why? Can you see you don't even at this point know why? And that's an issue. You do want to at some point discover why. Right? And, and the reality is if you're not willing to discover why, you're going, to go into, you're going to go into this place where you believe that you don't have the problem at all when the reality is, in that particular example, you imposed a lot of things on your audience in that particular example that were very unloving to your audience. And to be frank with you, you were overcloaked at the same time by a spirit who helped you go through that entire process. So you need to look at why. And there's some heavy addictions in there for to do such a thing. Heavy addictions in there. And, and while you tell me these words that you don't believe that you have those heavy addictions in play, the reality is your actions in that particular example demonstrate you do have these heavy addictions in play. And, you, and we can talk more about them privately at some point, but the reality is there needs to be more of a questioning attitude towards the addictions in play. Okay? And that's what I'm saying to you. Just. So, so love wasn't the motivating factor. And see, when love is a motivating factor, the first love that's motivating you is the love of others. Not the love of yourself, the love of others. Huh? I'm very confused about love. Love never sacrifices another person for itself. 
And you did in that particular instance. You sacrificed other people. You sacrificed other people's sensibilities. You sacrificed other people's morality. You sacrificed other people, all, all sorts of things in other people. You even sacrificed the host's home in that place. Right? And, and love doesn't sacrifice other people for the sake of itself. Love never does that. This is a primary, basic thing about love that we need to understand. So, so I feel for the team, there is a lot of this going on instead. <coughs> huh? A lot of selfishness. You're not, you're, not, you're not focused on how are other people going to you know, ha have to deal with the, what I'm doing. You're focused on, I should have the right to do whatever I want. Now that's not, like, love doesn't sacrifice another person for itself. It doesn't sacrifice itself for another person either. But it does both at the same time. So if, if I'm trying to do something that's loving, and I think it's loving, but I'm actually sacrificing you in the process, then I'm not being loving no matter how much I think I am. I am not. And I need to look at why. Now, unfortunately, what's happening for the group is that there are a lot of very, very powerful, strong, strongly negative, evil women spirits who are influencing your group. They want to take the God's Way of Love organisation and turn it into a mess, these women spirits do. And to be frank, if, if I didn't say anything to the group about this, your whole group would finish up becoming a mess because of their influence. Because many of you ladies in particular are heavily under their influence of these women spirits who have no desire at all to have you progress aside from dealing with the emotions that cause them to get, have more control of you. So they're perfectly happy for you to deal with every emotion that enables them to have more control of you but they do not want you to deal with any emotion that, has, that will release their control. And I'm saying to you, Barb, that you're heavily at the moment under their control. And to look at why. And a lot of this is about fear of angry women, fear of violent mothers, fear of, fear of vindictiveness of mothers and things like that. Look, can I have one thing? <coughs> um, <coughs> as I'm moving along this process, yeah. I'm really struggling to recognize or to feel what yep. it is to love myself. And so uh, I can see what you're offering me mm -hmm. and I'm really in a struggle with it. Well, I understand the struggle, like I do, because you, you're coming from a condition where, where love often hasn't been very present in our life for our entire life. And so recognizing mm -hmm. love is very difficult mm -hmm. for us initially. Most of the time, where we think addictions are loving. So, for example, if you're, you know, if you're a woman and you, and you meet a guy, right? So there's the guy and you're this woman who meets the guy. Most, of, most women have grown up with the idea that if this guy protects her, then he's loving. Right? So this is just an example. If he protects me, he's loving. He's loving me. And so they feel attracted to him because he's a protective type. Can I see, what I'm struggling most with is when I'm loving myself. I'm very confused about that one. Yeah, can I just continue uh, with the uh, illustration though? Yeah. See, in this case, when he's the protective type, she would be going, yeah, I like him, and also, I'm loving myself by being with him. Because he protects me, and I deserve protection. But the reality is she's in an addiction and she does not deserve any protection. The reality is we don't need to have protection at all if we're in a loving state. Right? So she's interpreting this as loving herself. This is the kind of man who loves her and she's interpreting it that's loving. Now when he no longer protects her, so let's say in public he tells somebody the truth about something that she said or did that she's ashamed of. She's no longer feeling protected by him, and so she's angry. Does that make sense? She's now angry because of the addiction is no longer being satisfied, which she believed was loving. 
but she's now, she's now angry. But I'm putting to you that both of them is not a love of self. The reality is if you're seeking protection from a male, you're neither loving the male nor yourself. Right? And the addiction is in play. And as long as he loves you, you'll feel loved. He, sorry, as long as he's protecting you, you feel loved, but it's not love at all. It's an addiction in play. And this is the problem that each of you face with your addictions, is you're not allowing yourself to recognise the unlovingness of them. Do you, do you see? You're not allowing yourself to see the unlovingness of them, and you go into confusion because the reality is you're used to this being loving, being defined as loving. That's the reality. And it's the definitions you've grown up with that you've now accepted as permanent as a permanent reality that this is the loving thing that a man does. He'll, a loving man will always protect me. A loving man will never humiliate me in public by telling the truth about my life in public. Now, the reality is a loving man will always tell the truth about you in private or public. Does that make sense? A loving man will do that. So these are the false beliefs on top of every addiction. This is the false beliefs on top uh, that drive every addiction, yeah. really. So, so the reality is, I'm believing <coughs> that a loving man would never tell the truth about some of the personal things about my life in public. And if he does that, I get in a rage with him and I tell him he's a slimy bastard, he's no good, and, and i just not interested in being with him, him anymore, right? And the reality is, that, he, that he, could, he could be in a place of complete love of you and you would not even recognise it. That's the reality. Hey, Jay, how does that fit with the idea of if it's not loving to tell somebody something that they don't want to hear? Well, it's not a truth that they don't want to hear. So um, if they hear it secondhand from somebody else because you've been telling the truth about someone and they hear it back, when you say it's not loving to tell somebody the truth that they don't want to hear, again, it depends upon the situation completely. So, for example, if I say to you, do you want to hear the truth about such and such, and you say to me, no, I don't, I'll say, fine. But if you say to me, yes, you do, then it would be a loving thing for me to tell you. Now, for you then to go and tell another person about the same thing without taking in the same considerations. That may be unloving for them to tell exactly the same truth as what I told you. Because if you haven't taken into consideration the fact of whether they want to hear it or not. Does that make sense? This is why most of the time I ask you whether you want to hear it or not. Even at the start of this meeting I asked you whether you wanted to hear it or not. Like I'm confused. Um, like um, I've told things of what I've seen as truths about Jen mm -hmm. to some other people, mm -hmm. and what was the reason? Well, I felt I was just it was part of a, something that I was talking about, and it just sort of fitted in. Yeah. Well, let let let, let me point to <coughs> that if the reason was firstly to heal something in yourself. So in other words, you, you're confused about something and you wanted to heal yourself or something, then that's a good reason. If the second reason is you, you wanted to get some advice about how to help Jen heal something in herself, heal the other person, that's a good reason. Sometimes I've done it because I've seen similar things in other people with respect to Jen and I've used Jen as an example. So yeah, and if, if Jen is happy with you using an example, that's another good reason. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. If the other person is happy with the example, can I, how do I write that? If the person is happy with the example. But there's also a lot of bad reasons. One might be I'm angry with Jen because of what she's done with me. And, uh, and then I tell other people because I want them to commiserate with me about how hard it is living with Jen. Uh, that would be a very bad reason. Does that make sense? Um, so it just depends, doesn't it? Uh, see, this is where we need to feel about love first. See, most of us are not doing that with truth. We're not going, 
what is the loving thing here? We just go, no, the truth. The truth is always loving. And the truth itself, without any emotion attached to it, is always loving. But if I'm now starting to tell you the truth because I want to belittle you, and the truth is, the emotion coming from me is, I want to belittle you. That's not loving. Yeah, I want to pull you down. That's not loving. I want to treat you condescendingly. That's not loving. I want to make you feel small. That's not loving. I want to make you feel like you, you know, you're useless. That's not loving. I want to make you feel like I'm better than you anyway. That's not loving. So the trouble is that many of us have these emotions. Like we could list a hundred of them that we might have. Right? And, it, and when we engage truth in that condition, the truth is the words coming out of our mouths are not the truth. Because what's really happening is the truth which is coming out of my soul is I'm trying to belittle you. I'm trying to pull you down. I'm trying to make you feel worse about yourself. I'm, trying, I'm angry with you and I'm upset with what you've done. That's the truth. So you'd be much better off saying the real truth. And that is, I'm really upset. The truth is that Jen does that and I'm really upset with her about that. That is more truthful than doing it for a third pur pur purpose if the first thing I stated was the truth. So if the motive was coming from a different motive, state the truth to the motive. Does that make sense? Uh, I've noticed, uh, like in your own behaviour, and I've been trying to understand it, that you often tell people at third persons about somebody else, you know, you, 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 you'll tell somebody about what other people's emotional injuries are and things. Um, most of the time it's when they've raised it first. Like, so, so for example, if somebody says, oh, this happened the other day, such and such happened, and this, this is what they did. And I will say very bluntly, yes, they have an unhealed emotion and this is the unhealed emotion, that's why they did what they did. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Because the person who I'm speaking with has questioned me about what's going on, like what's happening. And, and in that condition, my feelings are that every single person's emotional condition is totally open and exposed and all of us have to get used to it. But what about in the situation when you know that other person doesn't want their emotional injuries exposed. Well, from, from my feelings are anybody who associates with me tells me, and, and you have all at different times told me that you want the truth from me. Like, the reality is I'm going to give you the truth about everything. That's the reality. Does that make sense? Now, when you don't want it anymore, you'll either do one of two things. You'll come to me and say, look, I don't want it anymore from you. Most people don't do that, of course. You'll say, <laughs> you'll say I don't want it anymore from you. Or what you will generally do is you'll just get angry with me. And you'll say, I'm sick of hearing AJ because, you know, he did this to me and he did that to me and he exposed this truth to me and whatever. I've had so many people come to me and say, I want just the truth from you. I go, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to get that anyway. But anyway, no worries. Like, I'm perfectly happy to engage it. And then the very next day I engaged it, they're in a rage with me. So what does that tell me? That they didn't really want the truth. But you tell them anyway. Because they're saying the words to me, yes. They're saying... Like, even though you know they don't want to hear it, but yep. they say they want to hear it, yep. it's OK to tell them. And now we know whether they really wanted to hear it after I've said it, don't we? Yeah. Right? Well, now that they're angry with me, we know they didn't want to hear it. We know the truth. Does that mean we wouldn't tell them the truth in future? Because we've That's correct, I wouldn't. Yes. You know in your own life, like with someone like Dean, who we both know, that's exactly how I've handled the situation with him. I don't tell him anything more. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Because you know, he asked me for the truth, told him the truth, he didn't <coughs> want to hear the truth, he demonstrated he doesn't, now he's attacking me constantly as a result of it. He obviously doesn't want to hear any more truth, that's fine. But does that mean that you would or wouldn't use him as an example when talking to other people in ways that might... Of course I will use him as an example. He's a, he's a, he's a perfect example of what not to do. Of course, this is a situation where he might hear what I've got to say. Yeah. Yes. I am not going to pander to people who are in an unloving state, ever. Does that make sense? Ever. But I do that from a condition of loving them, not because I hate them or because I'm angry with them or anything like that. I'm not doing it out of an unhealed emotion inside of myself. Does that make sense? I'm not doing it to justify my own behaviour in any way. I'm just doing it because I love him. 
And this is where we need to have a look at our motive. Yeah. This is what, what, see, love has the appropriate motives. And this is what I'm saying as a team we need to do, is we need to look at our motives for doing things. Right? Now, now, I am very sure of my own motives when it comes to my feelings with Dean. I love, I love him incredibly. Right? Still, I feel that way, even though he has dedicated, and he's emailed me, lots of swear words in between, telling me, <laughs> that he's dedicated his entire life to attacking me. <laughs> right? And I still love him and I still feel for him in that place. I know how heavily overcloaked he is by some very dark spirits as a result of what he's doing. However, I am still going to say that what he's doing is not what a loving person would do. Simple as that. Yeah. Can we change? So if you are embracing <coughs> yep. truth about self and truth about your interactions with others, yep. which is hopefully where the place on, then in an interaction following on from what Graham said, mm -hmm. you would just say, I, I feel anger from you at this moment, or and then go away and But even then, you've got to be very careful, you know? Like, a lot of people think that I'm angry when I'm not angry. Mm -hmm. Honestly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got to first... How do you know? Well, you've got to first start with yourself. But isn't that a self-statement? No, you've I'm got to start with yourself. You? No, no, you're saying... You're saying... I wasn't being personal, I was being general. You're saying, I'm feeling anger from you. <clears throat> the implication... Is the statement you just said, right? Yeah. The well, implication is angry. the person is angry with you and you're feeling that. But that's really about angry in you. No, no, not necessarily. No. Not necessarily. <coughs> the person might be angry with you. Mightn't they? Yes. Or it might be they're just no longer wanting to do what you want and so you view that as anger. Many of you ladies have this with men. Yeah, where if a man doesn't do what you want, you automatically think he's angry with you. <laughs> No, he just doesn't want to do what you want, that's all. And he's allowed to not do what you want, right? But you think he's, he's angry with you because he's not doing what you want. Because, because the man who's not angry with you always does what you want. Is the way you see, you see. So the reality is that you could be feeling anger from the person or you could be just feeling that they don't want to do what you want and, and you view that as anger. You view that as a resistance to you uh, that, that you feel as anger. The reality is... Well, the second one would mean that you're actually angry. That I'm angry. Well, you see, again, everyone, like I feel, like I don't understand why everyone wants to overanalyze their emotions all the time. Honestly, the easiest thing to do is just to feel. Like, so, so when a guy, when a guy goes and tells his friend about you something that you're embarrassed about, just feel it. <laughs> You don't have to analyse why he did that, that he was being upset at the time, he was angry at the time. You don't, you might not even know what was happening at the time. Let's face it, you weren't possibly even there, so you might not even know. But even if he did it right in front of you, you still don't really know what's the driving force, perhaps, of the emotion. Feel your own emotions about it first. Feel it. Feel it rather than analysing it. So what are your feelings? I was humiliated, is my feeling. Huh? Now, I was humiliated is a very angry feeling. So it's a feeling of anger towards a person shaming you publicly. Huh? Why are you so angry about being shamed publicly? Because underneath that is some fear about shame, public shame. What's your fear about public shame? That they're going to, people are going to attack you now, they'll view you differently now, they'll treat you differently as a result of the shame. There's all sorts of fears underneath that. And then what's underneath that is a heap of grief, you know, about shame itself, feeling the feeling of grief about the shame itself. That's the feeling to go into in that moment, not to analyse the situation and go, ah, oh, was his motive loving or was his motive unloving and he did this, he doesn't seem loving. None of that's important for you. You've just had a law of attraction event that's going to help you feel an emotion. So feel the emotion. 
And if it's anger, understand that you're the one who's being treated in an unloving way. So go deeper into it, because it's fear or grief underneath this anger that you need to feel. Does that make sense? Don't overanalyze what they were doing and what I was doing and what they were doing and what I was doing as a response to what they was doing and so forth. Don't overanalyze all that. Just feel the feeling you feel inside of yourself. Huh? So when Ivana says, oh, we're going to do some auditions. Feel the feeling that you feel. <laughs> Many of you feel that like, oh, auditions, you've got to be joking. This is meant to be free will. I'm meant to be able to just get up there and do my... So feel that. Feel that thing right in that moment. Right? Don't say, oh, Ivana's been unloving now. Oh, what's wrong with AJ? He's just gone way off the deep end if he's given that to, as a, to Ivana as an instruction. You know? Like, you know, this is now you analysing why you feel bad. Not just feeling it. And you need to feel it rather than overanalyzing it. You need to feel the feeling you feel. And for many of you, you would have instantly got into, oh, I'm being tested. How does that feel? Like you've had a whole life of being tested that began, you know, a lot of times when you're two years or of age or younger, you know, like of test after test after test after test and then all through your school years, test after test after test. How does that feel? That you're constantly being tested and feel some of that because this is what the emotion is that's being triggered <coughs> allow yourself to feel it don't go oh you know, you know there's something wrong with AJ I need to discuss with him about this this is out of harmony with love definitely <laughs> it's out of harmony with love because because I feel bad so it must be out of harmony with love right so you know there's this automatic assumption that if I feel bad it must be out of harmony with love right the reality is it's an imperfect situation for you to let yourself feel a, a law of attraction event that your soul has created to help you heal so you can get closer to God. Does that make sense then? Mm -hmm. And this is where, where we've got to be very careful. So, let's say Graham, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter whether his motive was impure or pure, but he mentions Jen in a discussion with somebody else. And says, oh yeah, Jen has that problem. She went this and that and she did this and that and whatever. And then Jen hears about it. Now that's a law of attraction event that your soul has created. Now, if you, you can question for yourself what's Graham's motive all you like. And you can attack Graham for his motive even, if you want. But none of that is going to help you feel the emotion that created the law of attraction event in the first place. So you have a choice. If you're humble, you will allow yourself to feel the law of attraction event and feel it and embrace it in the first place. The other night, Mary came round and I was discussing with Mary, we were discussing how we were feeling, as we usually do, and, and Mary says to me, um, we were discussing about how... Um, whether there would be any uh, firm evidence for people external to the 14 that the 14 are the people they are claiming to be. Yeah. Huh? And I said to Mary, well, there may not be external evidence ever for that. Now, Mary instantly got pretty upset about that because mm -hmm. that means that we're sort of hanging our life out on the line without there any, being any future potentiality of anybody accepting the truth. Does that make sense? Doesn't love recognise itself? No, no, just let me finish. So you see, automatically you're going into condescension and questions. Mm -hmm. And you're just not letting me go with the emotions that are present. Yeah. Now, Mary then started getting feeling quite upset about that. And then she started projecting at me her fear. And then I started getting upset about her fear. I was just saying, look, I don't need your fear about it. And then, if I, and then I focused more on my own emotion. And eventually I got to the point where I was in a rage with God that there's no proof. No? And that I continually get attacked, condescended. Like every single day, I have like, like usually tens of emails and sometimes hundreds 
of emails with people attacking me, saying that I'm definitely not Jesus and what, you know, how bad am I thinking that I am and rah, rah, rah. And it just, every single day. Right? And I'm realising that, that all of that is to help me get into some of this feeling that I have with God. Like that I'm never, I'm always just going to be the kicking boy, if you like, and never, nothing's ever going to be satisfied truthfully. Does that make sense? And it helped me get into the emotion rather than questioning what, I don't question, I didn't question what Mary's motive was in projecting her fear at me or anything like that. Does that make sense? I just went into the emotion. And Mary, to her credit, just said, right, I'm going. <laughs> and let me be. And for the next hour or so, I, was, I cried for about an hour, an hour and a half or so about it. And got into some really good emotions about it as a result of the law of attraction of hand. And, and I don't have to question her motive for raising the issue. Like, I don't have to question the motives of the people who constantly bombard me over the internet about me. Most of their motives are pretty bad. Right? I, I get very frequently people saying, you know, God's going to kill you. You're going to, you know, yeah, there's a Christian saying to me that God's going to kill you and, you know, you, you're going to be in the hells and you're going to be oh, in hell, you know. And how dare you masquerade as our Lord and Saviour and all these different things, you know, like this, all this rage constantly. And I don't have to question their motive if I want to heal myself. I don't even have to analyse their motives. The problem with analysing their motive is I analyse their motive and go, yeah, I can feel he's pretty nasty. And then there's a tendency in me then to dismiss my own law of attraction. You see? To dismiss what's just happened to me. Instead of doing that, all I need to do is go, wow, that feels really bad. This guy's attacking me. What do I feel about it? Yeah, the reality is I don't have any proof that I can prove to him that I'm Jesus at this point. Aside from my memories and stuff, which of course he doesn't believe. But there's no, there's no external evidence that that would satisfy him. And how do I feel about that? I've just got to feel my feelings about that. Does that make sense? Yes. Not, not his. It's just a law of attraction event helping me. Can you see that? All I need to do is just desire to keep growing. And that's tough, that's hard. No, it's Lots not. Things get in the way. No, oh, I understand things getting in the way. It's not tough and hard, though. It's beautiful when you grow. So you see, even, even that attitude that it's tough and hard is an emotion that needs to be felt and released. You see, there were times in the past where I felt, yeah, it's all tough and hard, and now I don't feel a lot of those emotions anymore. Right? And trust me, I have a harder time with projection from other people than you do, Jen. You know? So the, the reality is that, uh, you know, if I focused on how hard it was and harsh everybody was with me, I wouldn't even get up and speak with you now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If you focus instead on yourself progressing in love and you enjoy the process of progressing in love, then you won't have that negative connotation of, every, of all of the progression. Chris, you had your hand up? Yeah, um, when I heard about it, I felt excited. But I'm you felt excited? excited? Yep. But I'm scared of people thinking that, like, thinking stuff about me. Yep. He thinks he's so good at that. That's why I've headed, headed for a while. Yeah, yeah. So um, the reality is that you do receive some of those projections where people, even though you are quite a humble person, other people around you believe that you're not being humble. Uh, the reality is that many of you will have all different emotions as a result of having an audition. Some of them will be quite you know, difficult emotions to deal with if you let yourself go through the process. And in the end, if we're left with a program where there's five people who we feel are ready to give a public performance, then we'd just set up a public performance for the five people and away we'd go. And that would be fine. And there's a beauty to that, in that every one of us would learn in the process, wouldn't we? We'd all learn something in that process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it, uh, when, you know that concert that was organised? 
Oh, it's not organised yet, but no. we're hoping to. I was going to have it as a winter concert, but that's not going to happen. It's now a spring one. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe even summer. Maybe even summer, yeah. <laughs> Depends how long it takes us to get this. <laughs> we actually got a few events planned, and one, one of the things planned is that uh, down at Armadale, um, the guys down there received the government grant to plant 10,000 trees. They received, they've been given the 10,000 trees. It'll take about a week to plant them. And what we're thinking of doing is having a big camp time down there uh, for a week. Uh, we're hoping that maybe up to 100 people might come along. And we will have, hopefully, um, performances every night. We're, I'm looking at buying some karaoke gear um, so that we can actually do karaoke. And, and, and we're looking at the arts team actually, you know, having some performances that you do, both acting performances and and uh, music performances and so forth. And uh, during the day we plant and, and spend some time together and camp down there and in the evenings we have some fun. So, and that's, we were hoping to do that in late October. Um, so the reality is that we would definitely like to have many of your team doing different things, but it, it's very, very important that everything's done from the right attitude. And to be frank, even if you're a fantastic singer, but you have huge demands upon your audience, I do not want to see you perform until you release your demands upon your audience. Does what that make sense? Sorry? What if we're not a good singer? Well, don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> Play instead, you know, and have someone else sing. Yeah, you know? You work with your talents that you do have, and we can all improve the other ones, and there will be different programs that we want to set up to help you improve your singing and so forth. But, but one of the things we must understand is that many of you currently, even those of you who have good singing voices, are still in heavy addictions with regard to your singing. And once you get rid of those addictions, you'll find you'll go through some poor singing for a little while, and then you'll get to be, once you've released a lot of the grief, you'll come back to very clear singing at the end. And in the end, you'll have very good voices. Most of you will have, if not all of you, will have very good voices, right? And so then we can start doing performances where lots of people are involved, because all of us are not going to be imposing our terrible voice upon our audience, and we'll be able to enjoy that, that any audience that came along would just automatically enjoy it. But we've got to go through this process first, this process of working through all of the emotions involved. Right? And we're, if, we're, if you want to stay in your addictions, you're not going to go through that process, and then, therefore the goal that we have at the end is never going to be achieved. And this is what we need to come to terms with. Is it possible to sing like the spirits that sound like whole orchestras? Is it possible to... Yeah, to sing like, um, like a spirit that sounds like a whole orchestra? It's, it's possible, is it? Yeah, certainly. Certainly. Um, and it's possible also, you know, to sing like a spirit who's in the eighth sphere, when you're in the eighth sphere. <laughs> uh, but, but the reality is that we've got a lot of progression to do. And, and the key is to prog progress using our passions and desires and also bringing everything into <clears throat> harmony with love first. Like focus on the love first. Yeah. Um, just to rewind a little bit, I, I got a little confused because when you were telling Jen about a dynamic between you and Mary, she jumped in and then you said, um, hear my emotions out, don't be condescending. So how, how was that working? I don't understand your question. Oh, it was just a brief moment where, like, you know, because earlier I was saying, what's the difference between disagreeing and being condescending? And then when Jen jumped in, you said, you're not hearing me out, you're jumping in, you're being condescending. Well, Jen, Jen's emotion is, oh. I don't think she said she was being condescending. No, said you she said was, that. Yeah. Um, the, Jen's emotions were that she didn't want to hear the story. Uh -huh. She wanted to focus on a part of the story. Okay, so that's being condescending. Well, it's, it's, a, it's an assumption that you already know the story right. and, and, the point, and it's also an assumption about the point of the story. Do, do you understand? Yeah, yeah. The point of my story was that I wanted to illustrate the point <coughs> of you can just feel your emotions right. without having to understand the emotions of the other person you know, who has done what they're doing. Yeah. 
that you feel bad about. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So the reality is that the reality is Jen wanted to take me off the subject, right? And I wanted to stay on that subject. And the subject is that when I am focused on my own emotional response in the sense of I'm prepared to feel it, I am not going to be questioning what your motives are in the question you just asked or the, do you know what I mean? I'll yeah, just, what you said, everything. yeah, I'll just focus on the emotions instead. Yeah. And that's the point of that story. Yeah. yeah. And um, my, most of the time, my point of telling a story is usually a point to telling a story that only comes at the end. <laughs> 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 Not halfway through. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and that's what we need to bear in mind when we're listening to other people too. Like, you know, often what happens is we discuss something um, when, and, and we, we have this uh, feeling of wanting to know the bits and pieces all the way along and our questions prevent the real answers coming to us. There's a lovely passage in the Life of Elysian book, um, if you've read it, and that is where Aphra, the spirit, who's constantly asking questions and he, and he keeps asking questions and the spirit who is who's teaching him is going, no, no, just just slow down a bit. Like, just slow down a bit. I'll get to that, but but it's not the best place to introduce it right now, you know. And um, and the reality is that you know in this discussion, what we're trying to do is discuss this issue of how we can learn to be more loving in a situation. And one of the primary ways that you can learn to be more loving in a situation is by making sure you focus on what is your own emotional response to the situation without projecting that response out, outwards. So, so in other words, what am I feeling as a result of what just happened is something that we need to question. Now many of us overlook what we're feeling very rapidly and words start coming out of our mouth instantly when in reality if we just thought, well, what, you know, what, why am I asking this question? A lot of the times the underlying emotion is is the thing we need to consider. Yeah, and I guess if you're just kind of like, like my question there is kind of like splitting hairs, is that, is that coming, that's when you know there's probably a wound behind there. Well, there's, there's usually fear behind it. Yeah. Um, because you, when there's, so in other words, you got the point of the discussion, but you were still wanting to, yeah, stuck on, yeah, stuck on the other thing. So you didn't really get the point of the discussion. Yeah. Can you see? Or maybe my concern had, why I got hurt, had nothing to do with the discussion. Yes, yes. So the key is to go into what, what am I afraid of here, or, you know, because it's fear that usually describes, that usually, we usually split hairs because of fear. Right. Um, unless there's a point of truth that you wanted to raise, you know, so question that within yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's fine to raise points of truth. The key is to not distract from a greater discussion. Right in doing so, yeah. Um, can I just ask something? Um, sure. Uh, there's this, for me it's been like this as well, um, that when I see that a lot of us um, perform um, publicly or where we're not ready and we do it to feel our fear, which a lot of us think it's loving to do it, but mm. now I'm realising actually it's really unloving. Yeah. It's harmful mm. to the audience and to the self. Very so, much so. Yeah. yeah. You remember so you Mary gave it, like, Remember it. Mary gave that talk about the frog, mm -hmm. the green tree frog. And remember she was telling and describing the different emotions she was going through and the effect it was having on the frog? Yeah. I don't know if you remember that discussion where she was actually describing mm -hmm. the different fears she was feeling and the effect that the frog, you know, the frog got frightened. Mm -hmm. When we when we go and present something to a group of people, if we come at it from fear, we are already being unloving to the audience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. When you're doing it out of passion and desire, now you're being loving to the audience. But if you're doing it about any fear, then you're automatically being unloving to the audience. You'd be far better off buying a microphone stand of your own with a little sound system of your own and standing up there in a microphone at home in front of the mirror right, and singing or whatever and dealing with some of these fears without imposing these fears upon an audience. They don't need your fear, they've already got enough inside of themselves. Most of us have, right? 
got enough fear inside of ourselves already without having ourselves impose our fear upon others. So it's much more loving to not impose your fears upon others and feel your fears more fully. Now, the, the reality for most people is we're still not very good at feeling our fear. This is why we revert to anger, right? Because we're not very good at feeling our fear. Our fear is a bodily sensation that we need to begin to allow ourselves to feel properly. And for the majority of us, we don't do that. Even when we say we're challenging our fears, we actually don't let ourselves feel our fears. The reality is, when you're fully in your fear, you will be trembling, you'll be shaking, other people will look at you and think, what's wrong with them? They must have, you know, um, Parkinson's disease or something. And, you know, there'll be all sorts of judgments coming at you because of you being in fear, when you're really feeling your fear. And that's why most people don't want to do it. Most people don't want to even do it alone. Because while they're writhing on the bed in their fear, they think, what's wrong with me? Am I going nuts or something? You know, there's all this judgment about fear. And the reality is most of us need to do a lot of fear work and we need to do it by ourselves. The reality is you can't deal with fear when other people are around generally because whenever they're around you automatically start getting out of your fear. It's rare for you to stay in your fear when other people are around unless the other person's a therapist helping you get into your fear. Rick? I'm in a bit of trouble. <coughs> in fear I feel like it's not really that bad. I'm in there, and then I'm wondering, am I actually in it, or am I No, just... not in it. Yeah. So you've got to start questioning what's happening. And with you, a lot of this is about spirits and, you know, feeling their fake-based emotions so that you can tell yourself you're feeling something that's real. Uh, to be frank, I, I, a few months ago, I, I talked to a group of people here about, um, I think it was the mediumship team, about, um, about the experience of emotions. And to be frank, there's still many people are still only in the emotions that that spirits are giving them. They're not yet in their own emotions. They believe they're in their own emotions, but they're not. Do you feel that's what's mainly happening with me? Uh, a lot of the times, that's what's happening with you, and that's why there's this feeling of distance from your emotions at times. Does that make sense? The times when you're not distant from your emotions and you're really in them, that's when they're yours. When you feel a secondary it's distance from your emotion, then you're not in your emotion. The reality is you don't analyse your emotion while you're in it, if you're really in it. Yep. Yep. And usually that's an indication that there's spirit stuff going on. Um, Yeshua, I'd like to talk about this Sunday event that I've planned. I've mm. actually gone right back to going, where did that come from, where even the inspiration or the thought of doing that? You know, it came from some women spirits yeah. who yeah. desired to create an event that would end up with the ostracism of the divine truth. Yeah, I can feel that now because it was so full on. And I, yeah. when people started coming, it was like, and I realised I never even considered the audience, it was like this consideration for making a space for people to feel fear, mm -hmm. forgetting that other people were going to be witnessing that. Exactly. So that must be something and did they want to? to look at. You yeah. know? Uh, obviously, they had the free will, people were coming and going and whatnot. Yeah. But, um, yeah, when people came, I immediately recognised something's not quite right here, and yet I still didn't. I got into overwhelm pretty quickly. Yep. Everyone was really like, I'm scared, I'm here, and yep. the spirit stuff started happening really quickly. Yeah, the um, spirit stuff kicked in immediately. Immediately, yep. yeah. And as a result of that, a lot of what happened chaos. thereafter it was, was like chaos. You yeah. talked before the anarchy, really, yep. with the spirits. It was, yep. so it, it, was, it was worse than like, the, like if I went to um, consider something to be a cult, like this, yep. is, this would be worse, the worst cult thing I've ever seen. Before. Exactly. And that's what the spirits behind it wanted yeah. to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. And what? the thing is, like, you're in there and then you just, and because you're so influenced, you're, you're stuck. Like, you're not moving. Like, I couldn't move, but I could, like, like, you know, there's some good part of me that wanted to leave, but most of it, and I'm just like, I'm going to stay. Like, I'm being. Yeah. Sit there and put up with it. Like. This is where this team's got to be very careful because yeah. there's going to be plenty of times when spirits want to manipulate the team. And, you know, there are other teams too that are going to have to be very careful. This one's one. The communications team's another. You know, any team that's got public exposure is going to have to be very, very careful how it displays love. Because the reality is there's plenty of spirits who want to discredit the divine truth at this point on, on the earth. And they're perfectly willing to use these events as a way of discrediting them. 
Because I was even amazed at how many people turned up. Obviously, it's a huge... I had to get into overwhelm to feel my anger. Yeah. So I attracted a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so why, like, a lot of... Yeah, I mean, people were viewing it as a divine love path event, which it wasn't. It was just a... It was open, a personal thing. Yeah. A personal event on yeah. Facebook where anyone could come. Yeah. But did the spirits encourage all the divine love path people to... No, come they, they encouraged all of the spirit people who are spirit influenced to come. Yeah. Yeah. So that tells you how many people were, are spirit influenced. Yeah, yeah. Because the majority of the people who arrived were, are, all have some kind of spirit influence. And did I attract, did I, um, I allow these women spirits to, to imagine having that event because of my anger I still haven't processed? Well, the, the reality is it begins with your fear, not your anger. You remember your anger is the result of your addictions, not the cause of them. Yeah. Your fear is the cause of your addictions. Yeah. So does anyone understand yeah. that? Like, your anger is not the cause of your addictions, your fear is. It's your avoidance of your fear that creates your addictions. And whenever your addictions are not met, then you get angry. Right? So the, the reality is that it's the fear that's the problem. So interestingly, you create an event which is to feel the fear, but the reality is that everyone rocked up was in their fear, not feeling it. And they all challenged themselves rather than feeling bodily their own fears. The reality is that you, you, know, you don't have to do very much in the end to actually feel your fears, you have to feel the emotion inside of your body. That's what you need to do. And once you do that, most of your fears will dissipate without you having to do anything. Mm. Does, does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, makes total sense. And you know, to feel, like I'll never forget the feeling of that day. Yeah. And that's not something I want to attract again, so that's really inspiring exactly. me to... Well, any day like that that gets heavily... And uh, there's been quite a number of these events, uh, private events, that have happened that have been heavy spirit influence. Another private event that occurred was uh, up at Peter's place with regard to, to having a dance night. Uh, now, if you, many of you look at the pictures of that and you go, oh, wow, look at all the orbs and look at the spirits around, isn't this wonderful, yeah. rah, rah, rah. <laughs> Let me tell you some basic truths about <coughs> spirits. If a celestial spirit could have a photograph taken of them, the entire photograph would be white. In other words, there would be no tiny little circle sitting on somebody's shoulder. The entire photograph would be white. Do you understand? When you see these tiny little circles sitting on someone's shoulder, these are often one or a group of very dark spirits with that person sitting on their shoulders. Now, I've seen some pictures shown of people where people come to me and go, wow, isn't this amazing? And there's lots of these tiny little circles. There's like thousands of them in a picture. That tells me how many dark spirits were present at that particular event. Do you follow me? Not bright spirits, dark spirits. So. I want to ask about one of those photographs. Yep. There's one where there's quite a big circle yep. around Sarah's belly. Yep. I was wondering if you could give the same truth about what that's... Well, a lot of times that is a person who's connected to the child that's yet unborn. And, uh, and that, you know, that person, if it's a fairly big circle, then it might be a person in a bit better condition than a very dark spirit, which would be like a smaller circle, less than the size of a person's head. Does that make sense? So it just depends on what, who it is and what spirit. And you can feel about those particular things. The point that I'm getting to, rather than answering the questions about all these other things, the point that I'm getting to is that we often go to these events thinking that they're fantastic events for us because we're going to have some fun and so forth. But the reality is that our addictions come into play very rapidly. And as a result of our addictions, many of the people, even in the pictures, you can see them with their eyes almost rolled back in their head, dancing. They're not there. I'm sorry, but they're not there. And you've got to start questioning. I'm not saying don't have these sessions. You've got to start questioning the type of music that's at the session, what's going on at the session, the addictions in play, the sexual projections in play at that particular event, and so forth. You've got to start looking at that if you really want to be serious about what's going on. Spirits will constantly use these events as a way to discredit the divine truth on this planet. The reality is, when you're in a condition of love, you don't necessarily feel attracted to events like that, unless there are certain 
feelings that you get from the event that are more harmonious with love. Right? The reality is we can have events that are like, you know, dances and so forth, where there is no sexual projection at all. But unfortunately, at the moment, that's not happening. At the moment, there, are, there is sexual projection going on constantly. There's lots of different intera interactions and interplays happening with these events. This is the time for you to be careful. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying notice, use your logic, notice what is happening. Feel the emotions of what's going on inside of whatever it is that's happening. And allow yourself to feel about whether this is loving or not loving. Does it feel loving or does it feel, or does it feel a bit creepy? What, what does it feel like? Now, in the case of your event, very soon it was obvious, due to the chaos at the event, very obvious that there's heavy spirit influence on the, with negative spirits involved. Now, as the person who organised the event, that would be the most logical time to just stop the event and just say, look, there's a lot of spirit influence going on here. We need to just stop. And we need to all just feel about why we're heavily influenced. Right? Now, the reality is, for the majority of us, we're heavily influenced because we don't want to feel our fear. Not because we do. Mm. So when you create an event that's for the sake of helping people with their fear, which was the underlying motive that you felt you had, you've got to question, firstly, whether you actually do want to feel your fear. Mm. And I'll put to you at the moment, Kathleen, you don't. don't. Well, it showed me at the end of the night I didn't. No, I got angry. because you get angry. And the reality is that the anger is telling you that you actually don't want to feel fear. The anger is telling you that you're in an addiction. Mm. You don't want to feel what you're really afraid of. And so, in between the fear and the anger is a layer of addictions. And the addictions are there to help us avoid our fears. And when our addictions don't get met, we get angry. Because we want to avoid even getting out. We want our addictions met. <laughs> We still want to avoid our fear. So the reality is many of us yet are get to get into the state where we actually do wish to feel our fear. Many of us are yet in that place. And the key is to, if we create an event for the sake of getting into fear, so I don't feel there's a bad motive in that, but we need to be aware of what's my own personal drive to this. Is this just so that I can feel good doing something for people? Or is it because I want to actually get into my fear? And if I want to get into my fear, why do I need everybody else to come along with me? There's also an addiction in that. And this is where many of us are. We, we want this addiction of, I don't want to have to deal with my fear alone. I want you to come with me. So we can share it. The reality is, if you try to share your fears, you'll never deal with them. Because all of your fears are personal. All of them. Right? So you never deal with them. So the key is to look at what's going on. So for, for the situation you're in, you got into anger, you know that you must have been in an addiction mm -hmm. automatically, and you also know that you were avoiding your fears, and the reality is when everyone...